Christmas. We are so excited that you've joined us here today for worship. As we begin our service this morning, we can't help but as we enter this Christmas season to bring our minds' attention to the Word of God, as we remember this Christmas season that the good news of Jesus Christ is that He sent His Son to come and live a life that we couldn't live and die a death that we deserve so that we can have life. The prophet Isaiah said this, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And Jesus in the Gospel of Luke said this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed. Will you stand with us and join us as we worship? Tell the good news. All right. Christ was born in a distant land. Tell the good news. Tell the good news. Live on earth for the good of man. Tell the good news. Tell the good news. Tell the good news. Tell the good news. Sing. 
The most effective form of evangelism, obviously, is one-on-one. -on -one. That direct person who knows you, who sees your walk, uh, and says, okay, God is real to this person. Why isn't he real to me? And they begin seeking. But how do you get to that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the person? Particularly when you know, there's 4 million people here, there's only about 7,000 evangelicals in the whole country. How do you find that person who is seeking? How do you find that person who's open? And so you need a big net. And then basically that, the, the radio is one of our big nets um, for evangelism. It has a reach uh, for the majority of Zagreb, which is a city of a million people. And during our two 15 minute uh, time slots, there's about 40,000 people listening, uh, which blew our minds. Now, obviously, that's the main purpose is broad seed sowing. About a year into the broadcasting, a, a guy started visiting and he just mentioned casually, yeah, I've been listening to the radio for about a year before I decided to come to the Sunday evening service. He said, listen, um, I have an old property that I'm not using. Uh, why don't you guys come over during the week and have a Bible study? So now that has become the second church plan. The Southern Baptists have had a huge role in what, uh, what has been an amazing uh, spiritual change and to keep that going uh, that we would see that this new lost continent uh, would be found through the lobby and offering. There's an impact I know but then I think there's an enormous impact that, that I'll never know until until we're in heaven and, and see. I believe that what we're seeing now is the first fruits but the one thing that keeps me here is this, this idea that I'm going to miss out on the most amazing thing that could possibly happen. and to be able to watch what God does and to begin to see the faces of the people coming in and their stories of how their lives have changed and how you know, they've been brought out of, of such of a mess and into life. That, that, that's what I hope for and pray for. Uh, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, you know, uh, an entire life uh, would be worth it. I'm glad to see you this morning. One of the things that I'm always reminded of is that Christmas time, we always set aside an offering time to take up a special collection that goes directly to our international missions. Uh, we do a lot of things well as Southern Baptists, and one of the things that we do well is that we have a network where we have missionaries, just like you've just witnessed, that are literally all over the world, and they're able to carry the message of Jesus Christ and to be able to live in places and to meet people and to develop relationships that we'd all be challenged to do. And they don't go for just a week. That Those mission trips are important. They go and they plant their lives there. And during this time, as we collect this special offering, what we know as the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, offering for international missions, Every penny of that goes overseas to support individuals like you've just heard. At this time of the year, we're reminded of Christmas. And Paul says it this way, Christ Jesus came into the world. And we, we celebrate the fact that he came into the world. But the rest of the verse says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul says, of which I am the worst. And we're reminded that as Jesus came into this world, he came so that salvation would be available. And the reason we believe in missions, the reason we support missions, the reason we encourage individuals to go, the reason we try to go as a church is because we believe the message of Jesus Christ needs to be told around the world. And as you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, you'll have that opportunity. If you can't go, this is a great way. And even if you can go, this is a great way for us to be able to say, I believe in missions and I want to support the work of Christ around the world. We do encourage you to give. As you give above your tithes and your offerings, you can just mark it on the envelope. You can leave a check any way you want to. We want to make sure that we do this. But even more importantly, here's the other thing I want you to do. Pray. Our missionaries uh, need your prayers. They not only need your prayers, they covet your prayers. Uh, many of them are living in very difficult circumstances. Many of them are far from home. Many of them will be celebrating Christmas with just their family. Uh, they won't be able to be here to celebrate with grandparents and aunts and uncles. And I think 
we as a church need to be certain that we are committed. By the way, not just at Lottie Moon time, but all the time that we're committed to praying for our missionaries. And so I'm going to ask you today in just a moment that you'd pray. You may know someone. We've had the opportunity for many from this church to go to go out and go overseas. And we want to pray that uh, God would strengthen them. But we want to pray for even those we may not know. God knows who they are. I also want to let you know I've been praying for you. It's been a challenging year, hasn't it? Uh, the reality is there's just a few weeks of 2020 left. And guess what happens next? We start all over with 2021. And who knows what 2021 holds? I do know this, though. I do know that God is still in control. I do know without any question that God has sustained us this year. And he's going to get us through next year. But here's what I want us to do. I want us to pray as a church for each other that we just don't get through these next three weeks. And I want us to pray that we just don't get through 2021. I want us to pray that we embrace every single moment that God has given us. and Use it as an opportunity to tell us about Christ, to live for Him, to make a difference in this world. We do have friends who are walking through some challenging times, and I know you'll want to pray for them. We have some that are quarantined and some that are experiencing COVID and we have others that are just recovering from surgery. We certainly pray for them and we encourage you to join us in praying as well. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just in a moment of quietness, would you take that concern that's on your heart? Would you pray, lift it to the Lord? Would you pray for our missionaries? Would you pray for our church? Would you pray for those around you? I'll lead us in prayer in just a moment. Father, we're reminded at this time of the year that you sent Jesus into this world. And we thank you. We thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. But we're also reminded that he came for a purpose. He came to save people like me and all of us. But God, we're so mindful that there are people here in our city. There are people scattered around the world who don't know you. And I pray, Father, that as we celebrate Christmas, that we would be reminded that you sent Jesus into the world for them as well. And I thank you. I thank you today for men and women who have felt your call, who are serving overseas in international missions. I pray, God, you would strengthen them. I pray today that no matter what's taking place in their lives, that they would be reminded of your presence, of your work, and of the power that you give them. We pray you would use their words in their lives to sow those seeds so that people really could come into a relationship with you. We pray, God, that you would let them know, as only you can, that if there's a church, there's a group of people who love them and who are praying today for them. God, we pray for individuals we know who are walking through hard times, and we pray you would strengthen them, remind them of your work and your presence in their lives. God, during this time, we pray you would help for us to finish this year well, living for you. And we pray, Father, we would embrace the new year as an opportunity to live for you. And I pray now, Father, as we continue through this time, that you would give us wisdom, hearts to hear you speak, and that we would embrace this chance now as a time to worship you because we recognize as we gather in this place, as we worship together online, we, we recognize without any question, you, God, you alone are worthy of praise. For it's in your matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us
to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, is the David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? the spirit move among us and does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves does our God intend to dwell again with us he does is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. And tongue. He has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Yeah. 
Thank you. May be seated. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we do thank you. We thank you that you are worthy. And God, in these few moments that we have, we pray you would use your word to open our eyes that perhaps today we would see more clearly who Jesus is and that we would live, leave here with greater courage, with renewed strength and with boldness that we would leave here having worshipped you. God, we come and ask you to use this time to change us and shape us. We thank you. We thank you that Jesus is worthy. For it's in your matchless name we pray. Amen. I am glad to see you this morning. I want to invite you to take your Bibles. We'll be looking in Revelation today. Revelation chapter 1. As a church, we have been reading through the New Testament, and we made it to Revelation chapter 1. And today I want us to look at the vision that uh, is given to us of who Jesus Christ is. I've been trying to uh, think through uh, matters dealing with uh, Christmas and everything else, and I can imagine that as Jesus was born that Mary probably held him in her arms, and she knew that this child was the Son of God, but then I imagine in the back of her heart and in her mind she was thinking, I wonder what this child will become. Every person that's ever had a child has experienced that. I remember clearly both when Catherine and Nathan were born in those moments we were in the hospital and Jana was uh, resting and recovering. I had those moments to hold them as newborns in my arm and to pray over them, to look into their eyes and to ask the question, I wonder what they will become. Today as we look into the nativity scene, we see that Jesus has been born. And today I want us to look afresh and anew at who this Jesus is, to understand as we look into the nativity scene that it's more than just the birth of a baby, it's the birth of Jesus, and Jesus is worthy. And The way I want us to do that today is to simply walk through this passage in Revelation chapter 1. Now I want to prepare you as we do go. Uh, there are at least 20 sermons in the first two or three verses. So put your seatbelts on. We're going to move through this. But this is going to be much more teaching than preaching per se because I want us to grasp the details. I want you to open your Bibles, leave them open, and I want you to follow along with me. And I want you to ask God, God, would you remind me of the truths that are found within this passage so that as we leave here in a few minutes, these truths wander with us and they go with us as we journey through this life. I encourage you as always to take notes as well. Revelation 1, beginning in verse 9, he says this, I, John, this is John, the disciple of Jesus, the beloved disciple, the brother of James. I, John, your brother and your partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus. It's a reminder from the beginning a little bit of what's going on. John calls himself a partner in the kingdom. He's a part of the church. But he says, and I'm also experiencing, just as you are, an affliction. The affliction is that persecution, that pressure that is coming upon them. Affliction means they are living in this continuous state of distress. It happens as we live in a world that's not our home, but it also happens as we live in a world which is not in favor of Christ, a world that is ungodly. And he says we are experiencing both the kingdom of God as well as the affliction. And he says we're also just staying under the load and the endurance. We're pushing forward. He says, I understand this. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus. I was on the island called Patmos, an island of exile, because he believed and he stood for Jesus Christ. He was imprisoned. He says that because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I promise I'll get to the rest of the passage, but let me just tell you this. I find it so interesting when I think through this passage and I've prayed it through and I've read it and I've meditated upon it. Here is, here is John in the moment of great distress, persecution, just trying to endure. And it's in that moment that he worships. 
It's in that moment that he looks for a clear vision of who God is. And I want to encourage you, my friends, my church members, my fellow followers of Christ. As we walk with Christ, life is hard. One of the things we need to be doing, one of the actions we need to be taking is to make certain that in the midst of the difficult days that we're worshiping God, that we're looking toward Him for a clear vision of who He is. That's what John does. He says this, he says, I heard a loud voice, there was clarity behind me, it was like a trumpet, and it says this, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. It's what we have as the book of Revelation. Out of curiosity, then in verse 12, John says this, Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. We'll learn in just a little bit as you read through Revelation that the lampstands represent the churches. I saw seven lampstands, the churches. And among the lampstands, listen, was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe. And with a golden sash wrapped around his chest, the hair on his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it has been fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. And here's John's response. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And Jesus laid his right hand on me and he said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but look, behold, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death in Hades. This is the child who was born that we celebrate at this time of the year. So listen today and glimpse into the nativity scene to see the baby Jesus and to understand that Jesus who was born is this Jesus. And he was sent here for you and for me. As we walk through this passage today, I simply want to draw your attention to the vision and our response. Notice, first of all, the needed revelation. John was in a moment of great distress, and in a moment of great distress, what he needed is he needed a clear vision of who God was. He didn't need some new truth. He needed to be reminded of what has always been. He needed to see Jesus today. You and I walk through all kinds of situations. Some of you are walking through decisions at home, decisions at jobs. Some of you are dealing with emotional challenges, and some of you are dealing with physical challenges. And then there's just the world in which we live, which sometimes, to be honest, is just flat-out frustrating. And what you and I need is not a better understanding of what's taking a place out there. What we need is a clear vision of who Jesus is. Because as we see him more clearly, then we find our strength and the wisdom and the guidance that we need to be able to live in the world that we live in. There's so much within this. So listen, as I walk quickly through this vision, John heard the voice and out of curiosity, if there's a sound that happens, everybody turns and looks. John heard the voice and out of curiosity, he turned around and when he turned around in verse 12, It says that he saw one like the Son of Man standing in the midst of the lampstands. And here's what that means. Jesus is present with his churches. The lampstands represent the church. And Jesus is among them. And the one thing that John wanted them to understand, or better yet, the one thing that Jesus wanted them to understand from the very beginning is that in a moment we will see that he is high and lifted up, that he is royal and regal. But to begin with, what Jesus wants us to know is that he is present with us. He is not a God who is high and lifted up and far away, but he is a God who is involved where we are. When you're walking through distress, you do not have to wonder, where is Jesus? Jesus tells us in this vision, he's right here 
with us. He knows what's taking place. He is aware, and as he moves among the candlesticks, it is a reminder, a symbolic reminder, that he is moving among his children. He is moving among the church. He is moving among those who know him. There's so many stories that we see this reflected. You remember as a child the story of Daniel in the lion's den. They threw Daniel into the lion's den because he refused to worship anyone except God. And Daniel says this, While I was in the lion's den, my God shut the mouth of the lion. Ever present, right there with him. In a similar story, you remember the story of Shadrach, Misho, not Misho, not sure who that is, I guess it's their cousin, but uh, maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The reason I always stumble over that is as a child, I used to enjoy the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go, and so I've tried to always get that out of my mind, but you remember the story how these three young men were thrown in the fiery furnace by Nebuchadnezzar, and they were thrown in there again because they refused to worship the emperor or the king, and they're determined they would only worship God. And in anger, he threw them in a fire that had been heated hotter than any other, so hot that it would knock down those who would open up the door. And When Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire, he was quite stunned because what he discovered is that he had thrown three people in, but there was four that was present. There was one walking around like the Son of Man. And it was a reminder that in the midst of great trouble, in great distress... That that was not a sign that God was absent or withdrawn, but God was still ever present and ever caring. And as John is on the Isle of Patmos being persecuted for his faith, Jesus was reminding him that he was still involved and alive and active in the life of all those who claim him, all those who know Christ as their Savior. He is a present God. He says he was walking among the lampstands as the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite self-designation. It's a term that comes from Daniel 7 that reminds us that the God that we serve sent Jesus upon this earth with a purpose. And as he walked upon this earth with a purpose that men denied him and he was crucified, but the crucifixion was not the end, but instead the crucifixion led to the victory of Jesus as seen in the fact that he rose from the grave and he exalted upon high where he sits at the right hand of God. And John says this, The Jesus who is ever among you, who is with you right now, is a Jesus who did not suffer defeat, but instead is a Jesus who is victorious and is forever lifted up. We look at the world, we wonder sometimes, is Satan get the, getting the better part of it? And here's what I'm reminding you. Satan is not the victor in this place. Satan may feel that he is. Satan may tell you that he is. But the one who moves among us is the Son of Man. He is the one who has experienced death, who lives, and who lives forever, and he lives victorious. Now look at the description that he continues to unfold. He says, he was dressed in a robe with a golden sash. He was a royal God. He is Jesus who is high and lifted up. Royal sash perhaps is a reminder that not only is he a royal king, not only is he royalty and regal, but he's also one who is the high priest. He was one who serves today interceding for you and for me, having offered the perfect sacrifice so that we could know him. Jesus is not a defeated king, but instead he's a victorious king. And he is moving among us. He is here ever present to care for us. In verse 14, he reminds us that he says, as he looked at this, he says, the hair on his head was wool. It was white and pure, a sign of agedness. A sign that he has long tenure and longevity. And with that long tenure and longevity comes wisdom. He is a God who knows the Jesus that we celebrate who was born at Christmas time is the Jesus who has all wisdom so that you can come to him in moments of great despair, in moments of great times of uncertainty, and you can know without any question that he is is right and his directions are always true he goes on to describes that not only was his hair 
white as wool. He says his eyes were like a fiery flame. They were penetrating. They were judging us. The God that we serve who sent Jesus into this world, who is raised and victorious, who is among us, is also one who is exploring your hearts and your lives, just as he does mine. He is looking in order to make certain that we are living and being the people that God wants us to be and judging those who are false teachers and judging those who are harming the church. He is not one who is unaware he knows. In verse 15 he goes on he says that he's also stable. His feet were like bronze that has been burnished in the fire. Bronze was known for its strength. It provided great stability. You see the feet of Jesus being made of bronze. You're reminded simply that he is not going to be moved. But not only is he not going to be moved, but that there is power that is found within him. Power that is unlike any other. Listen, y'all. This is the reason that we can pray to Jesus Christ. And as Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 3, we can pray to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. We find ourselves in a position where we think there is no hope and there is no way. And we look and we see clearly who Jesus is. And we see those burnished bronze feet as a reminder that there is nothing that is too strong for him. He is all-powerful and all-stable. He continues in the revelation of who he is, making himself clear. And he says his voice was powerful like the sound of cascading waters. If you've ever been at the foot of a waterfall, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls or any of those major falls when you're there, that sound is deafening and it is a reminder of the power. And again, I simply remind you that the God we serve is a God without question who has power. Think of this. God spoke and he said, let there be light. And you remember what happened? There was light. When Jesus speaks, there is power. We don't come to a God who is powerless. <laughs> when we look at Jesus as a baby, it's hard for us to imagine the amount of power that's found within that child. But when we see him in this vision, we understand clearly that he is powerful. He goes on, he says this. He had seven stars in his right hand caring for you and for me. The stars are the messengers, the direction that he gives. He had a sharp, double-edged sword that came out of his mouth. True. I don't know about you. I'm at a point now where um, I, am, I am rejoicing that as far as I can tell, the political season is over. It, I know it's never really going to be over, but at least, at least we're through a portion of it. In coffee and conversation, Jan and I, when we're drinking coffee, we're just kind of interacting and talking about things. And one time... This past week, one of us, I think it was Jana, but one of us looked at the other and Jana said to me, she says, you know, it's just hard to know anymore who's telling the truth. By the way, as an aside, part of that's probably because most of them are not telling the whole truth, but that's, a, that's just a political statement. Excuse me for making that comment. Who's telling the truth? Well, here's the answer. Jesus is. His word is true. His word is not only true when you see it as that double-edged sword, it's penetrating. As a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that the word of God is living and it's active, it's effective, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates as far as the separation of the joints and the marrow. It goes to the soul and the spirit and it reveals who we are. This is the Jesus who is among us. And finally, he says not only is he true, but he says he's holy. I love the way he's described in verse, the end of verse 16. He says, his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Holy. Beyond our understanding, pure. Radiant, brilliant. You remember in Exodus 33 that Moses asked if he could just get a glimpse of Jesus, if he could get a glimpse of God. 
And God said, my holiness, my brilliance, my radiance is so much that it would destroy you. But God said, here's what I'll do, Moses. I'll place you in the cleft of the rock. I'll place my hand over you, and I'll pass by. And when I pass by, I'll remove my hand, and you can see the trail of my train and get a glimpse of the brilliance of God. And as we look into this passage, that is exactly what God is doing today, is that He's revealing who Jesus is, and He's given us just a glimpse of who He is. And here's the reason why. This is not so that we can list the characteristics. My goal as you leave here today is not so that you look at this passage and you go, okay, I know that Jesus is present, He's victorious, He's royal, He's wise, He's just, powerful, caring, true, and holy. It's not an academic exercise, but he shows us who he is just so that we can get a taste of what he's like, just so that we can grasp, perhaps for the first time, in a new way, what it means to say without any question that the God that we serve, the Jesus who was born in a manger, is ever present with us. He's ever caring. He's always true. He's always dependable. He's always able. He is always And as we discover who He is, and suddenly we find ourselves ready to embrace this day and say, you know what? It doesn't matter whether politics are over or not. It doesn't matter how many named storms we have. And you know what? It really doesn't matter what happens with the stock market. We serve a God who's able. And Jesus is more powerful than any of those. And when you stand for Jesus Christ, you may have those who push against you. And what you need to do is not get frustrated that they're pushing against you, but instead look toward the one that you're standing for, the one who loves you and gave his life for you, and make a new determination that because of who he is, I will stand. Now, let me remind you. All of us need a revelation. We need a clear picture of who God is. Listen to what happens in the next verse. In the next verse, what you'll discover is not only the needed revelation, you'll discover what the appropriate response is. Any parent, any parent will understand that you spend time trying to teach your children how to respond appropriately to circumstances. For example... You try to teach your children that when they sneeze, they should cover their mouth in some way or fashion. You try to teach your children that when they are given something, they are supposed to say, thank you, and act like they mean it, at least for a moment, right? You are supposed to teach your children what their appropriate response is to a gift that they really don't like or want when the person that's given it thinks it's the greatest gift they've ever given. Those are challenges. We're always trying to teach our children how to respond appropriately. So how do we respond appropriately to God? Listen Listen to how John responded. Verse 17, so when I saw him, when I go to good vision of God, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Listen, when we get a clear vision of who Jesus is, when we understand him in all his fullness and in all his majesty, it impacts us, y'all. It should change us. It should overwhelm us. And too often we come and we say that we worship. We say that we've sung the songs and that we've got a picture of God. But I'll tell you, If it doesn't move us, if it doesn't overwhelm us, if it doesn't change us, if it doesn't cause us to stop and think, I don't think we've really got a clear picture of who Jesus is. But when you do get a clear picture, when you do really think about that the Jesus that we serve is present and victorious, that he's royal and he's wise and he's just and he's powerful and he's stable and he's caring and he's true and he's holy. When you get a picture of this, then we find ourselves overwhelmed that he even loves us at all. And John was overwhelmed. Do you remember that Peter had been struggling to understand who Jesus was? And finally he began to get a glimpse as he saw Jesus do miracles and as he heard him teach. And when... When Peter finally began, just began to understand a little bit, the scripture says that he fell down at the feet of Jesus, and he said this, 
Get away from me, Jesus. I am a sinful man. Listen, how many times, how many times has God given us the opportunity to understand just a little bit about who Jesus is and we walk away unchanged and unaffected? Listen, if you get a glimpse of Jesus and you leave unchanged, there's one of two things wrong. Either you really didn't get a good glimpse of who Jesus is, or you got some spiritual issues going on you need to deal with. John found himself falling before the feet of Jesus. By the way, when we fall before the feet of Jesus, we should be individuals who are overwhelmed. Very few things overwhelm us today. We should be overwhelmed when we see Jesus. We should be so much in awe of him. We should be people that fall at the feet of Jesus as a sign of repentance. As we see clearly, even as Isaiah did, Isaiah had that beautiful vision of God in the temple. And when he got the vision of God, he immediately said, Woe am I, for I am a man of unclean lips. And we get a picture not only of God's holiness, but a clear picture of who we are. We find ourselves discovering more completely who we are. And what keeps us from being more like him? Walk into a room, you flip on the light. If it's a bright light, it'll reveal a lot of stuff. Cobwebs, dust, stains on the carpet. You stand in the presence of Jesus. It causes us to fall down because we recognize we're not the people he wants us to be. The appropriate response is that we fall down in awe. We fall down in repentance. We fall down in worship just to celebrate who he is. You heard me tell you this before, it's not about us. A glimpse of Jesus in the nativity scene should be a reminder of God's love for us and we should find ourselves thinking about who this man is and who he is today among us, who Jesus is, and we just want to worship God because he loves us and cares for us at all. And that leads us to falling down before him in thankfulness as well. So let me remind you by end it, or let me end this way. So we have the chance to get a picture of who Jesus is, and we all need a clear revelation of Jesus. Let me just remind you, a clear revelation of Jesus is not necessarily found in an art museum. It's not necessarily found in a movie. It's found in the Word of God. Go to the Word of God. And when we get a real good picture, then we find out the appropriate way for us to respond. And finally... I want you to see this. I want you to see Jesus' compassionate reaction to you. When you find yourselves at the feet of Jesus, when you find yourselves overwhelmed by him, look at how Jesus responded, and look at how Jesus will respond. John says in verse 17, When I saw him, I felt like a dead man in front of him, and he laid his right hand on me. You know what that is? It's a sign of caring. It's a sign of compassion. It's a sign that he claims us as his own. It's a sign that he takes us, by the way, imperfect, fragile individuals who have nothing to offer him, and compared to him, we're nothing, but he claims us as his own, and he puts his hand on, his shoulder, on our shoulder, and he says, mine, it's going to be okay. I want to encourage you that perhaps... Perhaps if you just sit still and focus upon Jesus Christ and who he is long enough, that you'll feel, you'll sense the caring hand of God that's placed on your shoulder as he claims you as his own. And then he says, not only am I claiming you as my own, he says, let me tell you a few things. First of all, he says this, don't be afraid. Look, when we look at who Jesus is and we understand that we are his, then we have courage to face today. We have strength to face tomorrow. And fears dissipate. This world is full of lots of stuff that scare us. But Jesus is stronger than all. He says, don't be afraid. And then he says this. He says, I'm the first and the last. John tells us if you could go all the way to the beginning, beginning of time, what you discover is that Jesus was already there. 
He says, I was here before you got here, and I'm going to be here after you got here. You know what he is? He's everlasting. There's a lot of stuff that claims to be everlasting that's not. Have you ever noticed that everlast batteries are really not everlasting? But Jesus is everlasting. I am the first. I am the last. I am always present. And here's what he says. And I was dead, but look, I am alive. And I'm not just alive for the present. I'm alive forevermore. I am always alive. Victorious, the God that we serve. And he's reminding you right now as he claims you as his own and he places his hand upon your shoulder to encourage you to live the new life. He says, I just want you to know I've conquered death and because I've conquered death, you will as well. All you do is you believe, place your trust in him. (laughs) And then finally he says, and by the way, I have the keys. I have the keys of death and Hades. I have, Jesus says, the way to escape death and condemnation. They're in my hand. And as Jesus went to the cross and he died upon the cross so that you and I could live, the scripture says that as we believe, then suddenly Jesus says, set free, set free to live. And that power, that authority, that right is found within his hands because he is worthy. So listen, that baby that was born, it's Jesus. The baby that we celebrate right now, it's Jesus. The reason we have Christmas, Jesus. Jesus is present with you. He's victorious. He's royal. He's wise. He's just. He's powerful. He's caring. He's true. He's holy. Now will you respond to it? What will you do? Would you join me as we pray? Fathers, we look into your word, we confess that it's hard for us to completely grasp who Jesus is. But today, God, we we thank you. We thank you that as we think about you sending Jesus into this world, and we see him now high and lifted up, we thank you that today in your word, you've just given us a glimpse. And today, For people who have heard, God, I pray you would use this to strengthen and encourage. There's some walking through some difficult times. I pray you would remind them that you're ever-present, that you're victorious, that you're just and holy and caring. Father, as you remind us of who you are, I pray you would find us. Find us, Father. Not find us taking for granted who you are. Find us on our face before you, in awe of you, repentant and thankful and worshipful. We need you, Father. We thank you and we worship you. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. It's been my prayer, as I've thought about today, that God would just give us a quick a quick glimpse into who he is, to who Jesus is, and that we'd find courage and strength to live for him. He's worthy. If God's speaking to you today, and perhaps you're walking through a challenging time, and you just want somebody to pray with you that you would get a clear vision of who God is, we want you to know we're here for you. As a staff, we'd love to pray with you. There may be somebody here today who doesn't know him, doesn't know Christ, your personal Savior, and today he's drawing you in. He's saying, you know what? Why don't you come? Why don't you just believe I've made a way for you to live? If God's speaking to you, perhaps you're just feeling that urge in your chest and you can't figure out what it is. Perhaps you're just sense God calling you. Let us hear from you. We would love to pray with you. You can find us after church. You can call. You can email. We'd love to pray with you. But now I'm going to ask you to stand. Every person in this place standing, we're going to sing this song as a closing affirmation, a closing statement that we believe He is worthy. Will you join us as we sing?
that you've joined us here today for worship and as pastor just mentioned a moment ago maybe you need someone to talk with you pray with you you can find us uh without the information there on the screen by calling us emailing us or if you're visiting with us here in person today you can find our staff scattered all outside as you get ready to exit the building today we do want you to have a very merry christmas season and particularly we want to invite you here in two weeks december 20th we're gonna have a special christmas service and i know that you want to be here for that invite your friends and family as well. Today, I pray that as you go, the gospel will be on your lips and always on your heart. Let us pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And God, we thank you for the revelation that you gave to John so many years ago. And that same truth today that we can find solace in. So God, I pray that you'll comfort us, that you'll walk with us, and that we'll always remember the true meaning of the Christmas season. And that's that your son, Jesus Christ, came and lived the life that we couldn't live and died a death that we deserve so that we could have life. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.